Increased tension in the Middle East has caused crude oil prices to jump to the highest level and that's since October. Joining me now is our business reporter, Edward Boyd. Ed, higher oil prices means higher petrol prices and adding to inflation? adding to inflation, not just in Australia, but all over the world. So oil prices overnight, they surged to a five month high. You may have noticed it at the gas pump. Prices have been steadily going up over the last couple of weeks. AAA says the average cost per gallon in California statewide is five bucks. Nationally, it's about three and a half bucks. And here in the Bay Area, it's even higher. 506 in San Francisco for a gallon of regular unleaded. 4.95 in Oakland and 4.91 in San Jose. All of these prices up even from just one day ago. The Biden administration is backing off on refilling the country's emergency oil stockpile, at least for now. That's because the Energy Department says the administration is no longer going to be buying up to 3 million barrels of crude oil for a reserve site in Louisiana because uh, of a recent increase in gasoline prices. Uh, Mike, thanks. Yeah, Philly Fed President Patrick Harker becoming the latest official to complain that inflation is still too high, but not saying much else on monetary policy. But hold on, because there are four more Fed speakers uh, speaking directly on the outlook this afternoon and this morning. We do have these headlines now from the Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin. Let's get right to Steve Leisman, who has those for us, Steve. Yeah, and really uh, adding to the conversation you guys have been having, Barkin saying it's smart for the Fed to take our time before beginning the process remember that word the process of toggling rates down so if we continue to see strong job growth if we continue to see strong consumer spending and strong gdp growth then that raises a question in my mind well why would we cut rates maybe the dynamics that we have right now are actually sustainable here's another question are rate hikes off the table no, they're certainly not off the table. I don't know of anybody who's taken them officially off the table. A new Wall Street Journal survey shows Mr. Trump leading in six battleground states, including several Midwestern prizes. Biden is still within the margin of error in all of them. But it's a major reversal from 2020 when Mr. Biden won all but one of these states. The Wall Street Journal poll also underscoring concerns about Mr. Biden's fitness for the presidency. Nearly half of battleground state voters think Mr. Trump is more physically and mentally fit. Just 28% say it's Mr. Biden. November 5th, I believe it's going to be the most important date in the history of our country. Breaking news. Syrian state media are reporting Israel has conducted a rare daytime strike next to the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Reuters is citing Lebanese security sources saying that the airstrike killed a senior Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps leader. Well, now to some breaking news. CBS News has learned that U.S. intelligence believes Iran is preparing a major attack in retaliation for Monday's airstrike by Israel on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Now, the U.S. has warned Iran in writing not to attack U.S. personnel and facilities. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway. что все это реально грозит конфликтом с использованием ядерного оружия, а значит уничтожением цивилизации. Они чего этого не понимают, что ли?
Today is Sunday, the 7th of April. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come, plus a macro commentary. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Hope everybody's having a great weekend. Uh, tell you what I'm doing with my weekend. I was watching uh, basketball. It was really interesting. Now it comes down to Purdue versus UConn. UConn is the favorite. They play like a wolf pack, it's a complete team, and it is the favorite to win. But I think most Americans want to see Purdue win, because enough with UConn already, they win all the time. Think about it, Purdue is just a one-man team, it's all about Zach Eady. He has 7'4", 300 pounder, but he moves like a 185. If he goes full beast mode, I think Purdue might pull it out here and score a win. Needless to say, folks, it's going to be an interesting game tomorrow, so... We're probably going to have a shorter episode tomorrow to make sure that you guys watch the game. What else I've been doing in my weekend? How about getting a little high and watching some uh, wildlife documentaries? And this time around, I watched this documentary, Dynasty, the penguin episode. It almost made me cry. I was so emotional by the end. I think it brought out my inner Greta Thunberg. I was like, we gotta save the ice caps now. But it's really interesting with these penguins because uh, after they mate and the female lays the egg, she loses a significant amount of weight. So she has to head back to the uh, sea and eat for the rest of the season. And they hand the egg to the dads, the males, to deal with the brutality of the winter season. But these penguins are so intelligent that uh, to survive, they know that they cannot survive on their own. So when the storms hit, they form these huddles. And collectively, if they do these huddles, they stay warm enough to survive. And the egg will also survive with them. And after watching all of this, I'm like, F human beings. Why do we get to inherit this planet? We're dumb as rocks. Meanwhile, these penguins are so smart, I think they should take over. Speaking of penguins, how about that security at uh, LA banks? They're so slow. Matter of fact, LA during Easter saw the largest cash heist in history. $30 million in cash was robbed in the city of LA. And nobody knows how it happened. Our problem is take the bank or split right now. Do not go home, do not pack. Nothing. 30 seconds flat from now, we are gone on our separate ways. But this heist pales in comparison to the greatest heist in the history of mankind. The heist by the Federal Reserve of the future of this country. See, when they say, oh, the Fed is just printing money. No, no, no. They're not printing money. There's no such thing as printing money. They're stealing the money from the future generations of this country. And they're handing it right now to the wealthy, the oligarchy, and the current generation who's retiring by pumping the stock market. Because if they don't do that, and the retirees don't get to retire as they promised, everybody will know that this country was a scam all along. It's a Ponzi scheme. So the Federal Reserve stole from the future to pay the present, and of course empower the oligarchy by artificially lifting the prices of their stocks and real estate portfolios. The greatest heist in the history of mankind is what's going on by the Federal Reserve and the fiscal government, sending the national debt to over $30 trillion. And we're now adding $1 trillion in national debt every 100 days. And there is no such thing as, oh, the debt doesn't matter, there are no consequences, or oh, it does. But it's only going to matter for the future generations of this country, aka the Gen Zers and beyond. When you think about the Gen Zers, they're really baffling. They're getting robbed in real time, and they're not doing anything about it at all. The Wall Street Journal says the rough years that turned Gen Z into America's most disillusioned voters. Young adults are more skeptical of government and pessimistic about the future than any living generation before them. High levels of depression, isolation, no social life, consuming uh, all of the garbage in social media, cannot own a home, their wages not living to the rate of inflation, but they're just sitting there doing nothing about it at all. While the Federal Reserve steals their money and hand it to the boomer generation who's retiring right now. By the way, the most entitled generation in American history. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And the old geezers are having the time of their lives right now. Stacks at all-time highs, the value of the real estate, all-time highs, cruises, vacations, and they're beating the younger generation in a lot of things. See, the Gen Zers, they're so broke, they're now skipping first dates and they're meeting virtually instead. They can't even afford to buy a drink. Meanwhile, the old geezers are drinking so much to the point where we have an epidemic of drinking among older Americans. 
While the Gen Zers abstain from any sexual activities because they're broke and they're so weird, they don't have any social skills anymore, they grew up with Instagram and TikTok and the rest of it, nobody's getting laid. But the old timers, they're getting laid like rabbits. To the point where STDs are now rising among the older generation of Americans. So not only the boomers stole your investment, your future, home affordability, drinking and partying and fun, but they even stole chlamydia from you. And the Gen Zers are sitting there. They're so pathetic. They'd rather jerk off to OnlyFans, paying hundreds of dollars a month to jerk off to Denise Richards, who's making $10 million a month from OnlyFans. Um, she's almost a senior citizen now. <laughs> we used to jerk off to Denise Richard back in the 90s, so you guys are about 25 years late. And now the Gen Zers want to jerk off to Britney Spears and OnlyFans, who could make as high as $100 million a year, more than her entire musical career. You guys better up your game, I mean... 25, 20 years too late. Come on. Let's start a generational war here, folks. Forget about Russia, Ukraine. What else is going on this week? We have the solar eclipse. And NASA, of course, told us that we're going to have a full solar eclipse. This is the event that you've been waiting for for a long time. Grab your fake glasses and let's get blind together. Now NASA says, whoops, we made a mistake. Did we say that it's going to be a full solar eclipse? Eh, it might be actually not that full for a lot of you. This is the trusted agency that we also rely on in case there is an apocalyptic asteroid strike. Rest assured, folks, not gonna hit us. Might come close, but it's not gonna hit us. In a few days later, whoops, got a few hours to live. We're all gonna die. And speaking of dying, folks, it's among the fears that we have in life as human beings. But right now, when it comes to the economy and the market, we have three fears. Not in order, of course, but one fear is the Federal Reserve channeling their inner NASA when they said, uh, yeah, inflation is down, we're going to cut rates now. Everybody has to celebrate. Go ahead and put your blindfolds on and buy equities and buy everything because rates are going down. Now the Federal Reserve says, whoops, inflation action not going down. Uh, we, 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 we might change our mind about interest rate cuts. And the other fear is... What's going on politically? We talked about this numerous times, but it's the economy, stupid. And if the media and the gaslighting says that the economy is doing okay, but the population is not feeling it, then we might see a change this presidential elections. And are we prepared to handle that? And of course, we have the geopolitical fear. We talked about this numerous times in this program, and folks said, yeah, the geopolitics don't matter, Maverick. But well, now you're beginning to see how the geopolitical risk is accumulating. Not just Russia, Ukraine, now it's in the Middle East. And it seems that we're setting the stage for a global war. Any avid reader of history is really concerned about this period that we're living in. So maybe the boomers are onto something. Take the money, retire pretty good, and say goodbye. And leave those Gen Zers to deal with all of that mess. Maybe they'll go extinct before the penguins. But with that intro out of the way, folks, let's dive into the main topic of tonight's program. And here it is, in focus tonight. The sum of all fears, we got a little taste this week of how when these fears align, the fear of no rate cuts and inflation coming back, the fear of geopolitics and the fear of the election season, when they align together, you could get massive reactions in the market, you get massive reactions in the trajectory of this economy. And let's begin with the geopolitical risk and then we tie it all together. We know that when it comes to geopolitics right now, of course, we have China, Taiwan. That's always a worry. And what's going on with the economic divorce between the United States and China? And at some point, that's going to set the stage for a military confrontation that could be revolving around Taiwan. But the most immediate risk when it comes to the geopolitics, it comes from Russia, Ukraine, and what's going on in the Middle East. We begin with Russia, Ukraine. We've been told by our beloved and trusted leaders that if we send our taxpayer money by the billions to save the, quote, democracy in Ukraine, end quote, which is not really democracy, but anyways, it'll be worth it because the Ukrainians will defeat the Russians. The Russians are so weak. Uh, their troops are all dead. They're fighting with shovels. We just need a little bit of money, a few billion dollars, you know, 100 billion, 200 billion to finish the job. Well, now the war been going on for years, and it appears that Ukraine is not going to win, and Russia secured huge swath of their territory, and now it is under Russian control. And it appears that the tide is shifting in the war, where the Russians are gaining more advantage by the day. And the question now becomes, will the West just let it go and accept a Russian 
limited win at least and have a peace deal and wrap it up already? Or is the West so determined to humiliate Russia that they're going to take unbelievable risk to achieve this objective, even if it means, God forbid, a nuclear war? It appears that we're heading this way, ladies and gentlemen. This week, the Secretary of State, who's a huge failure, by the way, look at the mess that we're in all over the world. He comes out and says, oh, Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Well, the Russians said that's going to be a red line. We said before that we're not going to advocate for a NATO membership for Ukraine to avoid a nuclear confrontation with Russia. Now we're just crossing this threshold casually. To the point where the Kremlin now says that Russia and NATO are now, in quote, direct confrontation, end quote. This is World War III, the beginning stages. Unless, of course, some rationale miraculously just shows up in the picture and says enough is enough. This is too dangerous. We now have a NATO country in France that is openly suggesting sending its troops to fight Russians in Ukraine. And the Russians are warning the French, don't do it. So we're not just talking about it now, folks, that, oh, it might lead to World War III. It's already happening as we speak right now. And it seems that the Ukrainians want to drag us into a huge escalation here. They struck a nuclear plant. So far, the news is no damage, no radiation. But what if there is an episode like this? And we have uh, Chernobyl 2.0. This is insanity, folks. And we can ignore what's going on in Russia, Ukraine right now and the geopolitical risk but it will catch up with us. And that includes from the economic side. We've seen what happened in 2022 with the increase of inflation. Now everybody seems to say, oh, there's no risk anymore. But if there is an escalation of this war between Russia and Ukraine involving other parties, you will see tangible economic consequences. And hey, look at what happened in the Middle East war so far. We are seeing tangible economic consequence from that. The rise in inflation, you see what's going on with energy prices. You see what's going on in certain companies involved in this conflict, whether they like it or not, whether they've been really directly involved or not. McDonald's got hit really hard by the boycotts in the Middle East and other countries because of the stance of the McDonald's Israeli franchise about the war, donating cheeseburgers to the troops. It highlights the risk that companies have, specifically franchise companies. And this could be, of course, a case that will be studied in MBA programs in Harvard. If you have a company with a franchise, now you have to understand the geopolitical risk. How do you mitigate that? McDonald's decided to buy all restaurants, 225 restaurants from the Israeli franchise. They're now going to be under the umbrella of the McDonald's Corporation, and they'll be able to exercise control over the PR coming from McDonald's operations in that country. Will it solve the problem? I don't think so. I think it's only going to cost McDonald's more. And then what about the next country? Or a McDonald's franchisee decides to do something and it harms the entire company. Will McDonald's buy all of their franchisee restaurants all over the world, how much is that going to cost? So you look at the chart of McDonald's weekly chart, it appears that we're forming the golden arches here and the stack is going down. Now in this channel, we bought it at 250 after the Ozempic crash. Wasn't reasonable. Why would McDonald's go down because of Ozempic? But then we sold it recently at about 286 bucks a share. And I think it was a wise decision because this is a bad, bad outlook for McDonald's. It will cost them a lot of money and I don't think it's going to solve the PR problem in the Middle East and other countries. Now, there's a better company, better stock to invest in that also has a connection to McDonald's that we bought in this channel this week. We'll talk about that in the charts analysis, but back to the geopolitical risk because we've been warning and we've been afraid of the possibility of the Middle East war widening and involving more parties, specifically Iran. Of course, Iran been fighting via proxies. They cooled it down as of late. But this piece of news that we got this week with an Israeli strike in the Iranian embassy in Syria, that's going to change everything now. Iran is now ramping up their threats and their preparation for a revenge attack, a response. And the question now becomes, will it be a response in Israel? If that is the case, then we have a direct military conflict between two countries, Israel and Iran. And that's going to guarantee that the war is going to spread. It's going to get really, really ugly. This week, we got the news that Israel is scrambling GPS signals as the country girds for potential retaliation from Iran. So they know that there will be a response. And this is not just us talking about, oh, doom and gloom, something is going to happen. No, even U.S. officials and intel 
is now warning, yes, this is going to happen. The Iranians will respond. We just don't know when and how. The headline from NBC News reads, Biden officials worry Iran may hit targets inside Israel as revenge for killing general. What are they talking about? Here it is. A U.S. intelligence assessment warns that Iran could carry out an attack using a swarm of drones and land attack cruise missiles. And that Iran could target an Israeli diplomatic or consular facility in the region in retaliation for the strike in Damascus, according to two U.S. officials familiar with the assessment. Iran is likely to respond before the end of Ramadan next week. That's going to end Tuesday. So the response should be today, tomorrow, or Tuesday. We're running out of time here. Now, if you want my two cents, I don't think it's going to happen in Ramadan. I think it can happen later. But let's continue here and hear what the experts say. On Friday, a top aide to Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi said Tehran sent a message warning to the U.S. This is how you know that it's going to happen. And this is serious. They sent the message to the U.S. warning us not to get involved in the fight between Israel and Iran. In a written message, the Islamic Republic of Iran warns U.S. leadership not to get dragged in Netanyahu's trap for the U.S. Stay away so you won't get hurt. Mohammed Jamshidi posted an X. That's an Iranian official. He wrote that in response, the U.S. asked Iran not to target American facilities. So it appears that we're also accepting accepting the fact that Iran is going to respond. We're just saying, hey, don't don't hit us. Otherwise, we're going to hit back. You're going to hit Israel, do what you got to do, but there could also be consequences. We received a message from Iran following the strike in Damascus. In response, we made clear that we were not behind the strike. We also warned Iran not to use the strike as a pretext to further escalate in the region or attack U.S. facilities or personnel, a senior U.S. administration official told NBC News. The U.S. military has this week shot down two one-way attack drones near Al Tanf Garrison in southern Syria, according to U.S. defense officials. By the way, what the hell are we doing in Syria? Can somebody please explain that to me? Why are we occupying Syria? Anyhow, the drones were not targeting U.S. forces at all or at Al Tanf directly, they said, but were close enough that the military assessed they could be a threat to the U.S or to Israel. This is the most important part. There have not been any attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq or Syria for nearly two months. That pause followed an attack by Iranian-backed militants that killed three American service members in Syria that was met with a series of retaliatory strikes from the U.S. So what happened behind the scenes? Iran called us and they said, okay, look, one of our proxies went rogue and they hit you. They killed three members. You gotta do what you gotta do, do the retaliation thing, just uh, save face, but we're gonna call it off. We're gonna make sure that the proxies are gonna behave right now to avoid any direct confrontation between Iran and the U.S. So things were looking a lot better until this attack. And now the question goes back to Israel, specifically this mad man, Netanyahu. And we said in this program before when the war began that this man is in a mission to save his own ass. That's what it boils down to. And he's going to drag this war as long and as far as he can. Because the moment the war stops, he's going to end up in jail. And it's going to be the Israelis who are going to do it. They wanted him to go to jail before October 7th. So October 7th was the best thing that ever happened to him. Now with the pressure that he's getting because of the bad PR that is getting out of control right now. Over 30,000 dead in Gaza, including a lot of children. No electricity, no water. People are starving to death. And I think that the straw that broke the camel's back re the relationship between U.S. and Israel was this attack against the celebrity chef crew. They went to Gaza to feed people and they got targeted and killed. That was a major event, and it was so disgusting to the point where there was a change in policy by the Biden administration. And the support for Israel been dwindling. So Netanyahu now thinks, okay, how do I get out of this trouble? Let me uh, stir up another problem and involve Iran. I'll bomb their embassy. They have to respond. When they respond and they hit us, we have to hit back, and then we're going to drag the U.S. into a regional war between Israel and Iran. This is why this man is a madman, and he has to be under control ASAP before we have a major regional war. But again, this is the change in stance. Biden threatens to change U.S. support for Israel in Gaza during tense call with Netanyahu. President Biden emphasized that strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation are unacceptable, end quote. The White House said in a statement after the call, he made clear the need for Israel to announce and implement a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address the civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, 
and the safety of aid workers, he made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate, keyword immediate action on these steps. After the call, Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with reporters in Belgium. If you don't see the changes we need to see, there will be changes in our policy, he said. So again, Netanyahu looks at this and says, okay, I'm getting squeezed here. Let's start new shit with Iran and drag the U.S. into it. Now, Biden has to be really careful and he's taking a firm stance because it might cost him the election. Netanyahu might cost him the election comes November. Come on, man. We just had a vote in Wisconsin and there was the uninstructed vote. And before that, there was the uncommitted vote in uh, other states. But in Wisconsin, the uninstructed vote was about 48,000 or 8% of the vote in the Democratic primary. In Michigan, it was over 100,000 votes or about 13% in the Democratic primary. So Biden needs every single vote in these critical states to win the elections come November. If this issue sticks, he might lose. But at the same time, if Iran attacks Israel, he cannot take a stance against Israel because that will cost him even more in other states. So it is a really delicate situation right now, and we're running out of time. Either, we've been saying this for a long time, either Biden controls Netanyahu or Netanyahu is going to control him and determine his political future. And now Biden is trying to do the former. But we're running out of time because now Iran is going to respond. We know that for sure. The nature of the response will change everything. But like we said, it is costing Biden politically. The donors are now not showing up anymore because of concerns on the administration's stance in the war in the Middle East. And that leads us to the political risk this year, the election risk. And this is quite an unusual year because it's not, oh, we're going to change administrations from Democrat to Republicans or vice versa. This country is so polarized right now that if somebody's defeated or if somebody wins, we could see political unrest in this country, number one. Number two, changing the administration will also have huge economic impact on the market and on the global economy. I mean, think about Trump's stance against China. He's certainly tougher on China and has been ramping up the ante. That if he's elected again, he might resume the trade war against China, and that could be inflationary. So we have economic ramifications from the political outcome of this election. Now, the most interesting poll is the recent poll by the Wall Street Journal. It says that Trump leads Biden in six out of seven states. Wisconsin, that's a tie. But then you look at Pennsylvania, Trump up 3%. You look at North Carolina, Trump up by 6 You look at Nevada, Trump up by 4 You look at Michigan, important state, Trump is up by 3 so Biden needs every one of those uncommitted votes and this is how we tie the conversation between the geopolitical risk and the political risk georgia trump wins by one arizona trump up by five and it boils down folks the geopolitics are important and it might cost biden the election in these critical states but the overall theme of the elections will all be about the state of the economy and what's really interesting you look at all of these states the percentage of voters who say that the economy is not so good or poor in these states, it's not really high. I mean, 46 in Arizona, 51% in Michigan, 33% in North Carolina. So the majority think that the economy is pretty good in, in North Carolina, in that particular state. But somehow, the predominant theme, the unifying theme, is how Americans perceive the national economy. The majority in all of these states indicated the economy is not good or even poor. When it comes to the economy between Trump and Biden, who is best able to handle each of the following? When we look at the economy, that's the most important thing. 54% say Trump over Biden. So that's going to matter. The administration now has to do something about the economy. Because views of the economy among persuadable voters, those are the ones that you need to win elections, 74% say the economy is poor. 74. That is a huge percentage point. Well, gee, all I hear in the media is inflation is down, wages are up, jobs are plentiful, this is the best economy ever, this is the greatest bull market of all time. Why are the voters and the population in real life so dissatisfied about the economy? And that leads us to the third fear we're discussing in tonight's program. The fear of the comeback of inflation and no rate cuts, perhaps even rate hikes. But again, we go back to the voters because the amount of gaslighting by the administration and the media is absolutely disgusting. People say, look, inflation is horrific in real life. We're paying more. Our wages in real life, not the fake statistics by the government, are not really improving enough to catch up with inflation. We're falling behind on rent. We cannot own a home anymore. We're paying an arm and a leg at the gas station at the grocery store. 
any service that we need to do. We have to cut down on travel, leisure, any joy in life. And of course, we have to reassess the prospects for our children. Who's going to feed them? How are they going to get to college? What kind of future are they going to have in this economy? And of course, in the younger generations, they're foregoing having kids altogether because it is a huge expense. And this is how you destroy a society. When you have the Federal Reserve and the fiscal government with irresponsible spending and printing of money, borrowing the money from the future generation of this country to make sacrifices to enrich the oligarchy and pump the valuations in the stock market and real estate higher to make the rich richer. That's the consequence. And on top of that, we also get gaslit. And you wonder why we're dissatisfied? The Wall Street Journal says, what's wrong with the economy? Question mark. It is you, not the data. And in a nutshell, they argue that, oh, we're just, uh, we're Debbie Downers. We're just uh, too demanding. We should embrace biodynamics and how great the economy is. I mean, have you looked at the stock market? All-time highs. You should be happy with this economy. CNBC says, stop bitching and whining, uh, dear consumer. You're doing pretty good. The headline reads, demand for French fries reflects resilient consumer. As so-called fry attachment rate holds steady. Ah, the fry attachment rate. Now they're counting our f fries. They say, oh, look, you people are doing fine. You're just complaining too much. The economy is great. By the way, when we talk about fries, check out the new fries from McDonald's. Large fries. Talk about shrinkflation, not to mention the fact that they look sick. You eat that to get AIDS right away. So again, ladies and gentlemen, when you hear in the media that, oh, the voters are dissatisfied, but the economy is so great. Maybe the Wall Street Journal need to read their own articles once in a while. And maybe the media needs to wise up to this fact. The cumulative impact of inflation is still here, and it has done irreparable harm to the finances of Americans. You can gaslight me with, oh, the inflation rate went down below 3% this uh, month. You should be happy. Oh, I should be happy because inflation is still rising, be it at a slower pace. And by the way, how does that compare before the greatest transfer of wealth was initiated? Give me the pricing between 2019 and today. Because after the Fed initiated the greatest transfer of wealth in human history by stealing from the future to make the rich richer to save the stock market and pump it higher prices went higher dramatically the headline reads how far 100 dollars goes at the grocery store after five years of food inflation so here's what food cost you in 2019 if you pay 100 dollars, you get all of these items cereal chocolate gallon of milk some oat milk, maybe, some water, crackers. You get a frozen meal, maybe a detergent, banana, broccolis. You can see the items right in front of you. That's what $100 got you in 2019. Now, factoring the increases on pricing, you can see that pretty much all categories went higher in price from 2019. To buy the same items you used to buy in 2019, now you have to spend, instead of $100, or oh, about $137 to buy the same items. Now, I'm not a math wizard, but uh, that's an inflation rate of about 37% from 2019 and that's only food have our wages risen higher by 37% since 2019. I don't know. You let me know in the comments, but if you go to the grocery store with a hundred dollar bill right now, this is what you're going to buy a lot of items you cannot buy anymore. For $100, you have to sacrifice a lot of the items that you used to buy. And you wonder why the voters and the population is dissatisfied? Think again. But the propaganda media and uh, the regime will come out and say that, but food inflation went down to uh, 1% from 13 and a half. What does that mean to me? I'm still paying for higher prices. My wages didn't really live up to the rate of inflation in food. And oh, by the way, food inflation is coming back. When you look at certain items, 2019 to today, cooking oil up 54%, beef up 51%, fruit, snacks up 77%, mayonnaise up 50%, applesauce up 51%. The items that went down in price, bacon 6%. I don't believe it. I think bacon is more expensive. Otherwise, why would they charge me a dollar when I go to the restaurant for a slice of bacon? Tilapia down 11 percent cherries down 21 percent latino condom con excuse me latino condoms don't work just look at the explosion in the latino population but latino condiments are down 39 percent by the way isn't that politically incorrect latino right they should say latinx right i'm being sarcastic of course then we have assorted bagels 
down 49% from 2019. So I guess uh, let them eat bagels and Latino condoms, right? But it's not just food that's going higher. Gas prices are moving higher. You see it, you feel it. The Fed declared victory prematurely. They said inflation is dead. Or we're going to begin cutting rates. Oil prices said, okay, watch this. You're going to cut rates? You want to ease financial conditions? You want to pump the stock market higher and real estate higher? But somehow, you don't want to see inflation coming back? Well, here it is. We're back. And gasoline prices in California specifically, they've been high. They've always been high, but now they're rising aggressively higher, faster than the rise of the average gasoline prices in the rest of the nation. California, important state, huge population, huge economy. You restrict the population of California. You reduce their purchasing power because they have to pay more at the gas pump now. You're going to hurt consumption in the economy. And by the way, the Fed has to be aware that we have dynamics in the transition to EVs and green energy, which will lead to higher oil prices. But we also have demand for electricity surging significantly higher. Well, guess where electricity comes from? Huge part of it still comes from petroleum. Huge part of it still comes from nuclear. We see the share of nuclear actually moving higher. And this is why you've been seeing uranium prices doing pretty good, 23 in this year. And uranium stocks been doing phenomenal as of late. When we look at the geopolitical risk and what's going on in the Red Sea, what's going to happen in the Middle East war now. Sea shipping is becoming so expensive because of insurance rates. That's adding to goods and and now we see shifting toward air cargo by companies because sea shipping is costing them a lot. But with this demand for air cargo, what does that mean? Higher jet fuel prices and higher goods prices. You see it in the data, folks. Services inflation might be cooling off a little bit, but goods inflation is coming back. And the cumulative impact of all of that is a higher inflation rate. Another risk that the Fed has to be aware of is maybe China is bottoming when it comes to the stagnation in the economy. This week, we got stronger than expected data from China. And the impact of that is higher commodities prices. Just look at what happened to copper recently. Look at coffee futures. Look at meats. Look at grains. They're beginning to come back. Energy prices. So the Fed declared victory at the absolute worst moment. And now it appears that the Fed made another huge mistake. So we had the transitory mistake. Now we have the mission accomplished mistake. And the Fed is being too stubborn right now. They don't want to eat their words. They don't want to be publicly humiliated again. So they're saying, yeah, the data is coming out a little hotter, but it's not changing our stance. We're still going to cut rates. We're just, uh, uh, we're just going to push it down the, the line. Uh, yeah, we said it's going to happen in March. Now it's going to happen in May. Oh, May is not going to happen. How about June? Oh, June not going to happen. How about September? Uh, September? How about next year? The question now becomes... As they play this stupid game, inflation will keep coming back. At what point does the Fed eats a humble pie and says, folks, we made a mistake. Forget about the rate cuts. We're going to go back to hiking rates because inflation is coming back. That will be a shocking moment to the economy and the market. And by the way, you heard what Kashkari said from Minneapolis. He says, oh, maybe uh, rates as they are right now are sustainable. Baloney. Are you looking at what's happening in regional banks? What's happening in commercial real estate? So rates as they are, they're already damaging to the economy and they will cause a collapse in certain sectors in the economy. But they're not high enough to be collectively restrictive to the entirety of the economy as to erase inflation altogether. And this is why, and I will say this over and over and over again, until your ears bleed. We've been saying in this channel, the appropriate way to tackle inflation is the shock and awe. You raise rates aggressively higher, way above the official rate of the CPI, to shock the economy and create an inclusive pressure to all sectors of the economy to bring them from inflation to retraction. And then, of course, you have a recession. The market is going to crash. Got it. But you erase inflation out of the picture quickly, and then you begin to ease gradually. And the economy recovers. It will be a mild recession. The crash in the market will be uh, soon forgotten. But this approach of delaying the game because the Fed is pursuing a fantasy of having their cake and eating it too, that's what's going to lead us to an economic catastrophe, ladies and gentlemen. But it's not just Kashkari alone. This week, even Governor Bowman, she came out and said additional rate hikes could be needed if inflation stays high. So little by little, they're beginning to capitulate. And it seems that the hopes and the dreams, the fantasies really, of interest rate cuts are not going to happen, which means the rates will be higher for longer until something breaks in the economy. What are the ramifications of higher for longer rates for the national debt as it swells, the government 
meaning us, the taxpayer, will be paying more and more in interest payments. I mean, the national debt is projected, if you look at the median forecast, by 2050 will be over 150% of the GDP. We're already above 100 right now. We're paying over a trillion dollars in interest payments alone. Not to mention, of course, the pressure that the consumer is going to feel with higher rates for longer. The credit card debt that you accumulated to spend and cope with inflation, well, that's going to stay for a longer time than you anticipated. You'll have to pay more. It will restrict your finances. But rest assured, folks, if you thought that all of the Fed zombies are being hawkish now, no, you still got some zombies at the Fed selling the fantasy. Among them, of course, the infiltration at the Fed by the banksters, Austin Goolsby of Chicago. He says hot inflation readings should not knock us off the path back to 2% target. Um, would somebody please send this guy the memo? But again, he's playing a role. You gotta remember, he got his job via corruption. He was sitting at home, staying at the couch eating potato chips and drinking beer. His wife got so sick of him, she found him a job at the Fed via her bankster's connections. And he has one job to do, infiltrate the Fed and be our ally, the ally of the oligarchy and the banksters in the Fed. Make sure they don't go too crazy with the interest rate hikes. I mean, who cares about inflation anyways? Inflation hits the bums in this economy, who we don't care about anyways. Inflation is good for us. But I know what you're going to say, but Maverick, come on. The economy's doing pretty good. I mean, look at the jobs report that we got last Friday. Over 300,000 jobs, baby. Now, we can argue about the data being cooked or not. Let's play it as it is and assume that the number is real. What is the problem with this number? It is too hot for the Fed to cut rates. It is absolute insanity and lunacy to cut rates when you have this number. But again, you have to put everything in perspective. When you look at all of this bragging about jobs and the economy so great, all in all, with all of this increase in employment, we are still way below the 2015-2019 trend, number one. Number two, the majority of creation of jobs in the economy is happening in weaker quality. What do I mean by that? So we have the healthcare and social assistance. That is one of the hotter sectors of the economy. It's going to stay hot because of the aging population. I'm involved in this sector, and I'll tell you, for example, here, in Nevada, if you have a healthcare company, there is an explosion of senior citizens, say in the city of Vegas. So demand is here. The problem is you have no supply of workers. So if I want to hire nurses, for example, you have to recruit them from San Diego. Well, why would they give their jobs in San Diego to come to Vegas? What is the incentive? Cheaper cost of living? Not really. Cost of living has been rising higher here in the city of Vegas. Why would they come here? Sacrifice the good weather and the beach and the higher salaries in San Diego to come here? Doesn't make sense. They're only going to come here if you pay them more. So you have no choice. Demand is here. You got to run a business. You have to pay insane wages to hire these nurses and social workers and many other health workers, including doctors, by the way. What is the end impact of all of that? I have to pass the extra cost all the way down to the end consumer. I have to charge the consumer more. I have to charge Medicare more. The end impact of that is inflationary. So that's when it comes down to the healthcare sector of the economy. But look at the number two sector in job creation in this economy, government. 71,000 jobs last month. Well, that's only happening because the government is spending like a drunken sailor. With the comeback of inflation and rates staying higher, perhaps rising if the Fed decides to hike rates. This spending by the government is unsustainable. You can see that construction also created about 39,000 jobs last month. A lot of them in government spending category. That's going to be impacted too. Now, you might see it going higher because of the collapse of the Baltimore Bridge, but understand that the end impact of all of this is inflation. Leisure and hospitality remains okay, but also the pace has been slowing down. And as rates stay higher for longer, the consumer will spend less, will travel less, and this highly sensitive sector to the economy will be hit hard. But then you look at other sectors, the job creation is minimal really. So we're creating low quality jobs in the economy with the exception of the healthcare sector. Furthermore, when you look at the wages, wages are going down now. So the purchasing power of US consumers is diminishing. And of course, let's say, but inflation is going down. So your wages going down, that's good because it takes inflation down. We just talked about energy prices, folks. We just talked about food prices. We talked about the Red Sea shipping and the impact of air cargo. We're seeing the revival of goods inflation. All the indicators are leading us to believe that the rate of inflation will move higher in the next few ratings. At the same time, if wages continue to go down, we'll fall behind inflation again in terms of the rate of appreciation between wages and inflation. So the numbers can be deceiving. You read the media, you listen to the media, they'll say, oh, the economy is great, hot, hot, hot. 300,000 jobs created in the month of whatever. But then you peel the onion, you look at the details, you stitch it all together. It's not a good picture. This economy is just hanging by delays and extensions of the inevitable. We have to accept the recession to defeat inflation. It is inevitable. And the longer we delay the acceptance of this fact, the harsher and the longer this recession will be. In the meantime, 
inflation comes back. We have a phenomenon of stagflation in the economy. The question now becomes, are you prepared as a consumer, as an investor? Because this dynamic is actually pretty good for interest-bearing accounts. So if you have money market funds, if you're investing in bonds, this dynamic is pretty good for gold and precious metals. Look at the price of gold recently. This dynamic is good for energy prices, a lot of other commodities, until, of course, the inevitable hits. And we have a recession in this economy and we have a reset. So all what you've been seeing so far, even in the market, by the way, is just a reflection of the Fed's failure to do their job in defeating inflation. You got to remember this. The stock market shot up in a bubble in 21. We haven't seen the inflation impact of the rise of the stock market until 22. We're seeing now another bubble in the equities market. You will see the reflection of that in the inflation data pretty soon. There is a lag. And as inflation rises higher again, the question becomes, what will the Fed do re-interest rates? Are they going to stick with the cuts? Would it make sense then? Or will they do the unthinkable, which is raising rates again? Let us know what you think in the comments, but I got to move on here, folks, and cover the market activities for you. Let's begin with the closing of the indices on Friday, and uh, here we go. The diamonds closing in the green by 307.06 points or a gain of 0.80%. The Nasdaq rebounding by 199.44 points or a gain of 1.24%. While the Spider also closing positive by 57.13 points or a gain of 1.11%. The Russell 2000 rebounding but be the laggard of the day. And the reason is while the dollar went down a little bit, interest rates actually went higher. And the Russell is more sensitive to interest rates. So we see it positive by only 0.68 points or a gain of 0.33%. We look at the sectors on Friday, all positive rebound day, with exception of utilities. Defensives also lagging, be it positive. So it was not a risk off theme. It was a risk on theme in this rebound. We see comm services at number one. That's Google and Meta. I think those two names will stay hot until we get the reports from their earnings. And then we'll have a different judgment. Then at number two comes technology. Number three, industrial. So again, it is a risk on theme rebound on Friday. But the theme all in all for the week was not so hot so. It was actually inflationary. So forget about Google pumping up communication services. The number one sector by far was energy. And then we've seen a positive reaction by metals. So in the weekend video with the Matrix theme, we said it's going to be a battle. The managers are betting it's going to be the rate cuts theme slash the soft landing theme. So they went ahead and they bought small caps, biotech, real estate, regional banks. I said our outlook in this channel, it's going to be the inflation theme. You want to go with energy, you want to go with metals, you're going to go with trucking companies, certain industrials, certain staples. And it seems so far that the inflation theme is winning. We look at the breadth on Friday, pretty much neutral, although the NYC slightly positive. You got to remember throughout the week, the breadth has been awful. So we got a little bit of a rebound on Friday. The NYC, 62% advancing versus 36% declining. The NASDAQ, 48% advancing versus 48% declining. So pretty neutral on the NASDAQ. And the majority of the gains, if we look at the heat map for the day on Friday, the majority of the gains came from the big cap technology stacks, Amazon, Meta, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, although Apple is the laggard and it's been lagging for a while. But it was a rebound day, it was inclusive across the board. You see it in industrials, you see it in, in healthcare, you see it uh, in banks. And of course, the leaders for the week, metals, gold miners, energy, just continuing steady, steady positive reactions. The notable negative reaction that we got on Friday, Intel, the weakness continue after the data that they revealed that they lost $7 billion in their foundry business. So Intel continues to fall out of favor. Then we have the crypto proxies like Coinbase. Those went down on Friday. We got Tesla with the bad news that uh, Reuters revealed that the company is scrapping its so-called value model. So the day before, we got a fake pump in Tesla because they floated out the rumor that they might uh, have a cheaper model for the Indian market. Reuters says no according to the engineers and the workers in Tesla. That's not going to happen. So the stack goes down by about 3.5% for the day. Although after the bell, and again, Elon Musk is doing this intentionally. Elon Musk comes out and says, oh, but we're going to reveal the robo-taxis finally on August 8th. And we see a recovery aftermarket. Now, Musk is doing this because he's frustrated with Reuters. And he wanted to punish those who shorted the stack by revealing the information after Friday's closing. Now, he's been talking about robo-taxis for years now. He can reveal whatever he wants. I'll believe them 
when I see them in real life. It's not going to happen because of the regulatory problem. Not going to happen for a long, long time. Tesla's better off concentrating on upgrading the Model 3, not concentrating on these stupid projects. So we could see Tesla slipping down again and the pump fails. But we also have McDonald's down from Friday. This is based on the news that they're buying the Israeli franchise. It's just bad, bad, bad for McDonald's. Bad move. It will cost them a lot. And at the same time, it won't solve the boycott problem. If we contrast this theme with the weekly theme for the heat map, what do we see here? Huge contrast. The majority of the market was down. Pretty much every sector got hammered this week, with the exception of energy and metals. When we talk about metals, we're talking about gold, we're talking about copper. Those are the two sectors that did pretty good. In industrials, you have Caterpillar, government spending, China recovery, who knows? But the stack has been parabolic and it's been acting as an AI stack. There are three names in industrials, GE, Eaton, and Caterpillar. We see a big bubble and they're acting as AI stacks. But if we look at the defense contractors, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, all positive for the week, with exception of Northrop, that was down about 5%. And of course, among the big caps, Amazon, Meta, Google, Microsoft, those are the ones leading and keeping the market alive. If they went down along with the rest of the market, we would have seen uglier declines in the indices. When it comes to chips, we're seeing this interesting phenomenon where you have certain names that went way too high too fast. They're slowing down now. We're talking about Nvidia and AMD. Intel has its own problems. But we're seeing a rotation within this bubble, this uh, chip bubble, say out of NVIDIA into Taiwan Semi or Micron now. Micron is the hottest name in chips at the moment. And then we have other AI related bets such as Dell. And Dell was up big this week. So we're seeing speculation in this bubble. NVIDIA went way too high. It's overvalued. It's too expensive. AMD, it's the same problem. So we're seeing betters now speculating. Okay, if NVIDIA is a no-go, can I chase Micron? Can I chase Dell? Can I chase Taiwan? Can I chase another name like Marvell or Qualcomm? So we're now at the speculative stage in this AI bubble when it comes to chips. If we look at the heat map for the ETFs for the week, right across the board and right off the gate, we see the TLT down. That means the bond yields went higher. So we go back to the battle, rate cut theme or inflation theme. The evidence is clear. Inflation theme wins because the IWM was down about 3% for the week. But then you look at the XLE, XOP, OIH, energy ETFs, all up over 3.5% for the week. You look at metals ETFs, the XME up about 3% for the week. You look at gold miners, GDX up about 7% for the week. And SLV silver up about 10% for the week. But those yield sensitive bets, the soft landing bets, they were awful this week. Real estate, the IYR, down about 3%. XHB Home Builders, down a little over 2.5%. The XRT Retail, down almost 5.5%. The XBI Biotech, down about 5%. The KRE Regional Banks, down a little over 4% at the same time. Among the inflation theme, if we're talking about the revival of China, Chinese equities, FXI, MSHI, a bit positive for the week, but it adds to the cumulative evidence by the market that the inflation theme is winning. Let's do commodities. On Friday, we've seen muted reactions in crude oil, WTI, and Brent. Now we're waiting and waiting and waiting for the Iranian response. We've seen gasoline, our Bob, dip a little bit, but all in all, it was sort of a boring day in energy commodities, heating oil, natural gas, positive by a little bit, but nothing notable really. If we look at softs, again, the hottest commodity remains cocoa. That's up yet again about 5% on Friday. And coffee futures, we uh, indicated the cup and handle breakout in the charts and it scored gains of almost three and a quarter percent on Friday. Coffee remains hot, although we're seeing pullbacks in OJ futures. Cotton is continuing to weaken. Lumber is weakening too, along with sugar futures down about two percent on Friday. When it comes to metals, it's really interesting that we see platinum and palladium down on Friday. Copper down by B of the tick. But the precious metals, gold and silver, remain hot. And the reason is they work either way. Inflation, that's good for them. Stagflation, even better. And there is very little confidence in the Federal Reserve anymore. So you can't really go with the safety of the dollar. So everybody's now flocking to the safety of gold. Not to mention, of course, the geopolitical risk. Look at meats, live and feeder cattle futures down about 2% apiece on Friday, while lean hogs futures remain hot up about 2 and 3 quarters of a percent. Now, when it comes to grains, we continue to see signs of life. Wheat up about 2% on Friday, soybean oil also up about 2% on Friday, the rest are muted. But grains depend on the dollar going down along with China coming back. We see good signs about China demand coming back. The dollar, on the other hand, it's really tricky because if the Fed is about to hike rates again, I think the dollar is going to go higher. So that will remain a pressure on grains. If we look at the performances for the week, coffee futures, the winner with about 13% worth of gains. You see silver, lead hogs, heating oil, copper, crude oil, Brent worth about 
four and a half percent in gains this week. So again, all in all, it has been an inflation kind of week where we see the majority of commodities appreciating in value. If we look at the monthly performances, because we have a CPI coming this week, it's going to be the most important catalyst. If we want to look at the inflation rate going back a month, cocoa up about 58 percent, coffee up about a little over 16 percent. But you see the gasoline are bob, you see WTI, you see Brent all up over 10% in a month period. That's going to show up in the data. And all in all, that's going to keep the CPI elevated. And this could be, this reading could be really dangerous if it shows a tangible increase in the inflation rate. If we see the trends moving higher, not just consolidating, but moving higher, I think that will be a wake-up call for the Fed, a wake-up call for the equities market. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here on Friday? Volume moved higher a little bit on the three popular names, Tesla, NVIDIA, AMD, but Apple continues to lag. The majority of bets right now still calls, but we're seeing some demand increasing for puts. So Tesla, the majority of the spread is actually for puts. NVIDIA, we're seeing increasing bets to the downside. Puts are now about 43% of the spread. Same goes with AMD. So we're seeing some demand for hedging, some demand for downside risk. And that could have influence in the market. So if the market fails to recover, say Monday, Tuesday, but really Monday, if we don't see a big pop Monday, then the traders are going to paint the tape by buying more puts into the CPI. And that could add more pressure in the stock market. When we look at the flows, the bullish flows on Friday, SPY, NVIDIA, JP Morgan, Meta, the bearish flows, the SPX, the cash index, SMCI, Supermicro, Comcast, Nike. The interesting, unusual trades that I can see, and this is highly unusual, for the SPX, the cash index. Somebody bought the 510 puts for different expiration dates. They also bought the 512 and the 509 puts. They're all going to expire this month, but they spent about $33 million on those. So somebody's hedging big here, or maybe betting to the downside. And we will see a CPI correction like action in the market. Here we have another big one the 4400 puts for the SPX. And the expiration date here is November 15th, after the elections. They spent about $17 million on those. So we're beginning to see huge bets against the index, and that's usually a leading indicator that things are about to change. Here's another big one. For the SPX again, highly unusual. 5,700 puts, that's in the money. For the expiration date, June 20. And they spent about $14 million on those. Here's another one in the long side, though, for the SLV Silver. Somebody bought the 27 calls and the 33 calls for the expiration date, June 19th. They spent about $4 million on those. So now it appears that market down, the precious metals continue to go higher. If you look at more unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday, we begin with the ticker COIN Coinbase. Highly sensitive to the action in Bitcoin. If Bitcoin moves higher, I think Coinbase would move higher. But if we see Bitcoin going down again, Coinbase will go down by a bigger percentage point. So for now, somebody's betting that we have a rebound coming in Coinbase, maybe a rebound in Bitcoin too. They bought the 257 and a half calls for the expiration date, April 12. So this is highly speculative. It's a weekly expiration. Somebody's rolling the dice here, but they're betting big. They're betting that COIN will move higher and gain more than 7% this week. Paid about three bucks and 70 cents a piece. Denner, this trade, all in all, spending about $6.3 million for a weekly bet. Then we have GE, and every time we have restructuring of the company, we see more demand showing up to the point where the stock is in a bubble right now. But somebody sees more gains to come. They bought the 165 calls for the expiration date, June 21st. The expectations that the name will move higher and gain more than 5.5% by the expiration date. They paid about 6.5 bucks a piece, Denner, the straight. All in all, spending about $6.5 million. So it's a big one. And then we have BABA Alibaba. The spread is a little wide in this trade, but... Somebody bought the 64 puts, expiration date, May 24th. The expectations, Alibaba will go down and lose over 10% of its value by then. Paid about 85 cents a piece, Stenner, this trade, all in all, spending about a little over half a million dollars. And at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker LW, last but not least, for Lamb Weston. The stock got absolutely crushed this week. Down big, that's your French fries, right? They say, oh... The consumer is doing okay because they're eating fries. Well, the stock crashed this week, and somebody's betting for more pain to come. They bought the 75 puts for the expiration date, May 17th. The expectations. The name will go down and lose more than 6% of its value by then. Paid about one buck and 25 cents a piece. Standard. The straight. All in all, spending about $650,000. A lot of you have been asking, should I buy the dip because the stock is oversold in LW? The trader here says we see more pain to come, so you got to be careful with that assumption. Let's do some charts and then wrap it up we begin with SPY the S&P 500 narrowly chart what do we see here
year. We got a rebound Friday. This was anticipated after steep declines on Thursday. But now comes the debate. Is it recovery? Is it the beginning of a recovery move? Or do we have more downside to come? Let's start with the bearish side. We can argue that this is a topping head and shoulder. Down we go. We had a failure at the shoulder line at around 520.42. And now down we go. We can also argue that this could be a pattern of an inverse ABC pattern. And we have more declines to come before we find legitimate support. Now the bullish argument goes, but the momentum in the MACD on the hourly chart is improving. So we're about to cross from bearish to bullish. Sure, we got a hiccup on Friday. We tried to rebound. At the end of the day, we saw some sellers, but this was because of the geopolitics. Nothing happened over the weekend so far. And I think the momentum improves. And we head higher on the basis of a higher low or an actual ABC pattern convincing arguments by both sides. So we need to look at more charts. They have a better view of it. On the daily chart, what do we see here? We got a huge bearish engulfing candle and we lost the 20 days moving average. We traded above on Friday, but it appears that we have at least some damage showing up in the chart here. The bulls would argue, but we've seen that before. We've seen these bearish engulfing candles before, only for the dip to be bought. The bears would argue that this is third time and third time is a charm. Both sides have good arguments. Let's continue to investigate. But look at the vortex indicator. On the daily chart, it suggests that the bulls having the better momentum, that we could see continuation of the rebound comes Monday. The bears would argue, though, if you look at the three times when we had bearish engulfing candles, two failed to create a correction in the market. If you look at the MACD indicator, the last two times this happened, it was under bullish momentum, where you can see the green candles in the MACD indicator. Right now, we're losing momentum, and we're seeing the bearish momentum accelerating in the MACD indicator. So this time, it is different. This time, perhaps, third time is a charm. Now you have to understand that when it comes to the lag, the RSI lags the least, then comes the MACD, then comes the Vortex. And the reason why I use three layers of confirmation is my RSI is the leading, then I have a confirmation in the MACD, then the ultimate confirmation comes from the Vortex. But the weeklies are also important, folks. Let's do the weeklies, see if we have more evidence here. We don't see a huge bearish engulfing candle for the week. We see a little bit of damage, a little bit of stalling. We see the momentum indicator is weakening, so you have your RSI now curling back down. You have the MACD. The crossing from bullish to bearish is inevitable. It's going to happen. We're just waiting for when. And it could happen this week because of the CPI. But it's not just the question of when the momentum is going to change from bullish to bearish. The question of how. Will it be via, say, consolidation for a little bit? Maybe lose 2 or 3% in the rally? That would be an amicable correction. There will be actually a bullish signal that higher we go after that. Or will it be in a nasty fashion? Say the CPI comes out ugly and we see a huge flush down in the indices. In this case, the SPY. Then you have your confirmation in the MACD. Once you see the red candles in the histogram. If that is the case, then the first impression becomes really important. If we dip down to negative momentum via a flush down because of the CPI, that we will see more where that came from. And then we can speculate about the targets. 20 weeks moving average, if not all the way down to the lower Bollinger Bands. Furthermore, if we plug in some drawings in the chart, we can see that we got the inverse on the shoulder breakout and the market been running with no corrections for a while. You see the weekly closing. It appears that we've broken trend with confirmation. And this didn't happen in the last two times the market attempted, keyword attempted to correct. So we're seeing tangible damage. We're seeing something different this time around. And this is why I say that the bears are probably gaining some advantage here, gaining some momentum coming out of hibernation. And the wise thing for the bulls to do is hedge your portfolios before we see a steep decline. You don't know what's going to happen with the CPI. You don't know if the volatility is going to increase higher. You want to hedge your portfolio before you see a pop in the VIX. Then the premiums will become too expensive. If we look at the SPX, the cash index daily chart, what do we see here again? You see the trend line. We tried to correct before. All of these attempts failed. This one, we've lost the trend line. So it appears that this time around, we have more damage than before. Now, is that indicative of one way or the other that, oh, we're going to rebound and go higher again, or do we have more declines to come? I would say it increases the odds for the latter, that you got the first whack, you're trying to recover from it right now, but then you have a shock coming from the CPI, and that could be the one that seals the deal with a big flush down. So needless to say, CPI day is going to be really, really important. Now, when we look at the futures, the hourly chart for the E-mini futures, what do we see here? We got a flush down. We lost plenty of support lines. Friday, we did some recovery. We reclaimed 5,218, but we failed to close above 5,257.25. So I'm going to use that line as my bull to bear advantage line. 
If we trade above, the bulls regain the advantage. We keep getting rejected. We go down from this point. Then the bears will be in charge. If we look at the Q's hourly chart, it's the same thing. You can look at the pattern. Got the flush down. Got a rebound Friday, but we closed below 440.59. It appears that we stalled there at the end. Maybe at a lower high. So the bears would argue, you got your head and shoulder potential. You got your inverse ABC pattern potential. The bulls will counter and say, but look at the hourly MACD. It's about to change from bearish to bullish. We think that the better outcome and the most likely outcome could be an actual ABC recovery. That we got a rebound Friday in the A leg, got the B leg by the end of the day. Monday we do the C. So again, Monday's put up or shut up for the bulls. Either you go back to the highs again or you're risking disappointment comes the CPI. We do the daily chart for the Qs. Anything notable here? Yes, we're seeing damage. We lost the 20. We have a bearish engulfing candle. We failed to close above the 20 moving average comes Friday. So we're seeing damage here. Is it decisive though? Well, let's clean up the chart and use a trend line instead. You can see here that we've broken the trend and we have better confirmation than the SPY. And I've been saying all along that the queues since this mania has been led by big camps and chip stocks. The Qs, the NASDAQ, will be the leading indicator for the S&P 500. And if it is, it's not looking pretty good. We can also argue that this could be a topping head on shoulder pattern. So right now we look at the Qs and I think that the bearish arguments have the upper hand. If we look at the NDX, the NASDAQ 100 weekly chart, what do we see here? Notice the difference between the S&P and the NDX. In the NDX, we already have a confirmation in the MACD indicator that momentum is changing from bullish to bearish. So again, I'm going to stick with my theory. The NASDAQ is the leader, leading indicator in this case, the S&P. We see loss in momentum in the Vortex, loss in momentum in the RSI. Suppose we have a really nasty correction. From a weekly standpoint, we go all the way down to the trend line that I'm indicating right now. Believe it or not, that's still going to maintain a bullish trend line with higher highs and higher lows. So it doesn't matter if you're a bull or a bear. You want to see this correction. You want us to go down to the trend line. The bears get to eat. The bulls, if they hedge their portfolio, no harm done. But you get an opportunity to buy at a better price. If you firmly believe that this is a sustainable bull market, then going back to the trend line, is the kind of test you want to see for validation. Because if it fails at that trend line, then you're going to have to change your strategy. Then we'll look at the NASDAQ futures daily chart. What do we see here? We have the double top. We lost the trend line. We're now just flirting with the support of 18,121 and a half. If we have another down day in Monday, it's all more for confirmation that the trend has been lost. And now we are in a real corrective phase that could be amplified by the next CPI. But we need to see where the damage is coming from in the technology sector. If you look at the SOXS, the Philadelphia Semiconductor ETF, it's more of an equal weight than the SMH. On the weekly chart, can we argue that we have a topping candle followed by bear flag consolidation pattern combined with weakness and momentum looking at the RSI and the MACD? Sure. So we're seeing weakness in chips and it is notable. When we look at the XLK, the big camps. In this chart, we can see that we already have a confirmation in the MACD indicator that the XLK is already in bearish momentum. Chips, not yet. So the weakness, believe it or not, is coming from the XLK, not so much from the chips. Why? Because Apple been weak. And if we see another name joining, be it Microsoft or Meta or Google or Amazon, joining the weakness of Apple, it could exacerbate the move to the downside in the XLK. Now, the SOXX is suffering a little bit from Intel, from some names, but the big kahuna in these ETFs, chip ETFs, is NVIDIA. So we'll look at the chart in a minute, but what about the IWM, the small caps index hourly chart? What do we see here? So we got a whack on Wednesday with a gap down. We got an attempt for a recovery comes Thursday. We closed the gap. Then we had a failure at the gap. And then came the flush down. Are we in an ABC, inverse ABC pattern as anticipated? Maybe not so much. Maybe not the cleanest. Because Friday we got a rebound. But the rebound failed at 205.59. We can now argue if we continue to trade below 205.59 that we could be in for a head and shoulder pattern. The confirmation for that head and shoulder, I'll be a little more conservative here. I'd use 202.53 as my confirmation line. And again, it's a head and shoulder pattern within a larger head and shoulder. So you got a head and shoulder within the head and shoulder. This is the Christopher Nolan pattern. On the daily chart, we lost the 20 days moving average. We closed the gap above with the bearish engulfing candle. So it leans more bearish. You look at the weekly bearish engulfing candle failed to keep support at 205.49. Momentum is now being lost in the MACD and the Vortex and the RSI. So the odds, once again, suggest that we go negative in the IWM, maybe retest the 20 weeks moving average at around, let's say, 198. On the dollar, four hours chart, what do we see here? We're holding on to that trend. Lost it for a moment. 
but then we're just holding on that trend. Now, we can argue that this could be a head and shoulder pattern and we lose the trend either way. So the dollar goes down. You, know what? you might say, hey, but this is going to be good for equities, Maverick. But it hasn't on Thursday. The dollar and equities went down together. But certainly, the drop in the dollar would be good for commodities, specifically gold and now maybe grains. So keep an eye here that we might see the dynamic. We go back to the daily chart of the dollar. Nasty looking candle on Friday. If we lose the trend, we have the 20 days moving average at around 103.854 basis points, the white line in the Bollinger Bands. If that fails, then the dollar could go down even more, and that would be even better for the old man gold. Now gold been rallying impulsively higher. We know what the reasons are. We can speculate in the reasons. My theory is stagflation, but gold been hot, hot, hot. Lower dollar will improve the performance of gold. So if you see any dips in gold, those are Bible. Is the chart way too hot? Yes, it is. But look at the bigger picture, folks. The monthly chart. You got a consolidation pattern since 2020 in an inverse head and shoulder pattern. We're now just beginning to break out. So whatever pullbacks you see in the longer time frame, gold is extremely bullish. If you look at the gold miners, GDX, it's the same thing, monthly chart. We're getting out of a pattern of lower highs and higher lows. The tension is being released to the upside. Of course, the month is too young. But for now, it appears that gold miners will also catch up with the spot price of gold. On the weekly, it is expanding the Bollinger Bands higher. It closed above my number, 33.5. Next stop could be 36.17. On the daily, a little too hot. But again, if you see dips, you gotta buy them. The SLV Silver daily chart, way too hot. Outside of the Bollinger Bands, can we get a pullback? Sure. But are the dips buyable in silver right now? The answer is yes. You look at the weekly chart. We had this consolidation pattern for months and months and months. Now we're breaking out. So there's a lot of energy to be released in both gold and silver. If we look at UK oil brand daily chart, what do we see here? We got the ABC breakout. We closed above 89.61. Is it a little too hard? The answer is yes. Can we get a correction if we don't see action by Iran? The answer is yes. But the question now becomes, do we keep 89.61? or do we lose it? Do we maintain the same outlook in oil as we have in gold and silver? That the pullbacks are Bible? The answer is yes. And the reason is you look at the weekly chart. We're just breaking out. Look at the momentum in the hour side, the MACD, the Vortex. They're all bullish. Pullbacks in the daily will happen. But at the end of the day, I think that the weekly resistance is at 95.91. If we get there, we might see more of a sustainable stall. But on the daily, I don't think it's going to last. Furthermore, on the monthly chart for UK oil, and this chart should scare the Fed. Look at the momentum in the RSI accelerating, the Vortex becoming bullish again, and the MACD is about to give us confirmation. It's going to change from bearish to bullish. And we have a double bottom formation. Can we see a breakout in oil? Can we go back to the highs of 22? The answer is highly possible. If the Fed continues to talk about rate hikes, they're going to lead oil higher. So again, dips in gold, silver, oil, those are viable. We'll look at the individual energy names. This week, I've been touting Halliburton, HAL weekly chart. You can see that it has a little bit more room here to go all the way back to the highs at 43.99. Let's call it 44. Momentum is is getting bullish, but it's not overbought yet. So I see the dips as viable here in Halliburton because if you look at Exxon, Exxon already made the highs. So Halliburton is lagging. I think there is a catch up play here. Then we'll look at the 10 year yield daily chart. We're getting the bull flag breakout. Friday was a good day for 10 year yield because of the employment report. Now, if you look at the momentum, it's all positive. Most importantly, what about the weekly chart? We're above the 20 weeks moving average. Momentum in the MACD, look at the MACD. That's beginning to change from bearish to bullish. We might be in for a breakout here, folks, in the 10-year yield. Now, what will be the catalyst this week? It will be the CPI, the PPI. If it is, you know what the threshold is. The algorithmic threshold, 4.5%. If the 10-year reads over 4.5%, the algos will begin dumping equities but we could be in the cusp of volume getting 2.0. If we look at rate sensitive charts, we begin with the XHP home builders. We have a bearish engulfing candle and we lost the important support of 108.44. We lost the 20 days moving average, but then came a rebound Friday. Does it change anything here? It doesn't until it passes the highs of the breakdown slash the bearish engulfing candle. If we see yields going higher, the assumption is XHB will go down. But for now, the XHB remains strong because of the theory that we have a housing shortage. The weaker sector is actually the IYR real estate. If we look at the hourly chart, we got a gap up Thursday. Then we have a failure at the gap, big flush down. We lost 87.47. Got a rebound Friday, but we failed to close above 87.47. So for now, I see the IYR is weaker than the XHB. And the daily chart, if this weakness continues, we'll be heading down to the 200 days moving average in blue. That is around 85. With the weekly chart, 
We see the damage in the IYR. We closed below the 20 weeks moving average. We have negative divergence on the RSI. We have negative momentum now showing up by the red candlestick in the MACD. So if you want to short real estate, you go maybe with the IYR versus the XHB. XHB needs to weaken a little more before it confirms and unlocks more trades to the downside. If we look at regional banks, KRE, it's the same pattern. We have the gap higher, failure to fill the gap, flush down Thursday, tiny rebound Friday, but not convincing. This could be, yet again, a head and shoulder pattern within a larger head and shoulder pattern. Same Christopher Nolan pattern that we see in the IWM. So these sectors, the KRE, the IYR, and biotech, they're influencing the IWM. And the assumption is if yields go higher, that's not going to be good for regional banks. They head down. If they head down, the IWM will be dragged down with it. So right now, all what the bulls got in the KRE is the hourly momentum. Can it change from bearish to bullish? And we have a rebound Monday, sure. But again, the odds say that higher rates are coming and the KRE will probably head down below 47 and a half. If you look at the XBI biotech, the weekly chart. We lost the 20, we went down to my target, 87.89, then caught a rebound and closed above the 20. But the damage is done. You see that it's just a matter of time before the MACD indicator gives us the confirmation for bearish momentum, switching from bullish to bearish. You see those red candles showing up. The hour size and negative divergence, the vortex indicator, already given us confirmation in the weekly. So for now, XBI week, KRE weak, that suggests that the small caps will also be weaker. If we look at the VIX, the volatility index, what do we see here? Got a little dip on Friday, but again, folks say, oh, it's a huge rebound in the market Friday, Maverick. I don't think this correction is going to happen. I think we go higher again. Look at what the VIX did on Friday. The VIX did not budge. To me, that's a sign that the risk is still to the downside. It is expanding the Bollinger Bands higher. Momentum is turning bullish in all indicators. MACD, daily RSI, daily Vortex. Most importantly, in the weekly, we're firmly above the 20 weeks moving average. We're expanding the momentum higher. We're expanding the Bollinger Bands higher. I think we're on the cusp of a breakout in volatility. If we look at the monthly chart, look at the monthly MACD. That's about to change from bearish to bullish. So again, I think there was a big breakout coming in volatility, with it a big correction in markets. If we look at Apple, Big Kahuna, hourly chart, what do we see here? Flush down Thursday, rebound Friday, but failing to close above 170 again, firming up the outlook of a topping hit and shoulder and down we go. If we go down, we have 167.16 as my next support. Now, you got to be careful with Apple because the bulls can still argue that if we look at the daily chart, look at the daily MACD, that we're still in bullish momentum. We could recover. Now, the bears will counter and say, but you had your chance and you failed at the 20 days moving average. Look at where I'm highlighting, the white line. So the odds say down you go. Weekly chart, what does that say? Again, we have support. On the weekly chart this time around, 165.67. And we still got room to go to the downside. The chart has expanded the lower Bollinger Bands to that point where we can go down a little more. Then what about Tesla? On Discord, we talked about a trade on Tesla where we looked at the pre-market hourly chart. And I said, let's go with the 160 puts because we have a bear flag pattern. And here's how it played out. Tesla indeed flushed down and went down almost to 160. Now the problem is if you did not close the trade on Friday, you got stuck with the post-market pump by Reverend Musk, the robot taxis, because the stock recovered. Now, will it continue to recover Monday? We see more demand because of the robot taxi rumor. Or will the sellers show up again and be more aggressive? If it is, I think the line of 170.60 is pivotal. We lose it again, and you did not close the 160 puts. You should have, but if you didn't, that's okay. If we trade below 170.60, you probably want to double down on them because we'll see another fade of that news. But if we keep holding on 170.60 as support, you got to take the loss because we'll probably see more excitement, and more pumping of the stock. On the daily chart, what do we see here? We have a sloping line of resistance. We lost the 20 days moving average. We're catching support from the lower Bollinger Bands, but boy, look at the daily MACD. That's going to lose momentum. I don't know if the robot Axis pump will get us above the trend line or not. So that's another parameter you have to look at. If we close above the sloping line, then it turns bullish. If we fail to close above, then the bearish outlook persists. If we look at NVIDIA, what do we see here in the hourly chart? We talked about a bear flag that took us down Thursday, but we haven't lost 860. In the same morning brief, we talked about 860 as an indicator. We lose it, SPY goes down. We keep it, we see a rebound. So right now we see 860 being held as support. If NVIDIA loses it, we got a problem. Because you look at the daily chart, we've been in a pattern of higher highs. Now we have lower highs. We lost the 20 days moving average. We have a clear rejection after retesting the 20. Over and over, we have a clean rejection. But losing that line on the hourly, the 860, we can argue if you want to be more conservative on the daily chart, you can mark it at 850. We need to lose 
860, the be conservative 850 to unlock more downside, let's say aggressive downside for NVIDIA. If we look at BTC, Bitcoin, tulips, what do we see here? We've been talking about the possibility of lower highs and lower lows, but now after the recent rebounds, we have a higher low. So what do we do with this chart? Let's clean it up a little bit and we have a triangular consolidation pattern. We're waiting and waiting for a breakout. It could go either way. You see a break above, you got to understand that the proxies will go higher. If you see a break below in the triangular pattern, then you'll see the proxies going down. So you look at Coinbase daily chart, we have topping at a shoulder, rejection of the 20 days moving average. The assumption goes, we head down to the lower Bollinger Bands, absent a bullish breakout in Bitcoin. The same goes for micro transity. You have the topping head and shoulder. We retested the 20, it's not working so far. So we wanna stick with the shorts specifically if we have a bearish breakout in the chart of Bitcoin out of the triangular pattern, if we have a bullish one, you got to cover your shorts because you probably see a recovery in MicroStrategy and the other proxies. Same goes for Robinhood, a little stronger than Coinbase and Micro. On the daily chart, it is flirting, closing exactly at the 20 days moving average, unlike Coinbase, unlike MicroStrategy, both lost their 20 days moving averages. Not in this chart. But if it does give up 1840, the 20 days moving average, and heads down, then we're probably going to head all the way down to the lower Bollinger Bands at around 16 and a half. So you want to pick up some puts on Robinhood. If we see a recovery in Bitcoin out of the triangular pattern, and uh, Hood recaptures the 20 days moving average, then we're probably heading higher. We look at Mara, the miners. We lost the 20. We're expanding the Bollinger Bands to the downside, but that's going to be support. So the downside is a little bit limited in this chart, even though we have the halving event we could see more pain to come. But you look at another miner, CLSK Clean Spark. It has been outperforming Mara for a while, but it is also at risk because you look at the double top pan and you look at the support range that I'm highlighting. If you lose that and Bitcoin breaks the consolidation pattern to the downside, I think Clean Spark will go down further than Mara. Now, the last chart that I want to share with you, since we talked about McDonald's and I have an alternative for McDonald's, it is Krispy Kreme the ticker DNUT. We talked about this in the morning brief on Thursday, that I'm buying shares awaiting a breakout of a falling wedge pattern. It appeared that we're heading that way, but again, Thursday was an algorithmic selling program across all equities. So Krispy Kreme went down too. But then comes Friday. We have the upgrade by the analyst. And we see Krispy Kreme gapping higher, doing the break that we were looking for on Thursday. So I'm going to stick with Krispy Kreme here, and I added it to my portfolio. We sold two names this week. I sold Cigna and I sold Cody. We'll talk about the beauty business in another video because Alta Beauty gave us a warning. And that's why I sold Cody, even though I've been holding it since 2020. But I added Krispy Kreme to my portfolio. And I'll just let you know that we're seeing the bottom line improving. And now all of a sudden they have all of these McDonald's stores, which means that they can cut costs in their own stores and at the same time increase the volume of sales. So I don't think that I'm chasing here what comes to Krispy Kreme. I think we have more appreciation to come. Now with that out of the way, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? We have a lot. Monday will be a little slow. April 8, we have gained the propagandist from Chicago zombie Goolsby. Tuesday the 9th, we have the NFIB optimism index for small businesses in the economy. But all eyes will be Wednesday, April 10. We have the CPI, aka the CP lie. And it comes with whole sales inventories, the monthly federal budget, and the minutes from the previous FOMC and then commentary by Zombie Goolsby again. Comes Thursday 11th, we have initial jobless claims and then we have the PPI, the producer price index. And then we have a bunch of Fed zombies speaking from Governor Bowman, from Boston Collins, from Chicago again, Goolsby, from Atlanta, Bostick. The banksters are working Goolsby over time this week. You should ask for a bonus. Friday the 12th, we have import price index on top of the preliminary reading of consumer sentiment. And again, Zombie Bostick from Atlanta, and then from San Francisco Zombie Daily will be talking. But with that, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please help us out here by pressing the like button, leaving a nice comment, subscribing, and consider being a member either here on YouTube or Patreon to access our daily videos and exclusive content. But with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Yeah,